Live. Here we are. It is Friday, November 24th, 2023, day after Thanksgiving. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. We did. Uh, got uh, most of the kids together at a friend's house. We had about 15, 16 or 18 people for dinner, and uh, it was a good crowd. We had a wonderful time, and I hope you all did as well. All right, and here we are. It is We're heading into the sort of quiet period between now and the new year. Uh, a lot of the auction houses aren't doing too much. But one of the things that I wanted to do in, uh, this week is talk about a, an auction house in England. I've mentioned a number of times in videos. We've talked about things that they've gotten and so forth. But I've never really talked about the auction house itself. And maybe it was a way of introducing many of you to it who've never used them. And that is the company uh, known as Woolley & Wallace. And uh, they are located about uh, they're oh about an hour and ten minutes southwest of London, sort of near the Southampton area in, in Salisbury. Uh, it is a, a wonderful auction house. They've been there for a long time, and every year they run several um, series of auctions of Asian art, Japanese, Korean, and uh, Chinese. And what's interesting about this company is that they they not only uh, uh, do a great job with the photography, they get a lot of good estates. They get old collections with lots of provenance and if you're a provenance fan and you're interested in england and their their history of trade and whatnot they're always they always seem to be turning up uh interesting collections uh just uh, uh recently they had uh this one the kitchener porcelain collection and they had a good write-up on them field marshal um horatio herbert kitchener and uh they the, this collection has been put together over the last 150 years and this is the this was the first time any of the pieces from the collection were sold publicly and they have a nice write-up on it and explain all about it and uh, it's a it's an interesting company and they do this a lot and you'll notice in their sales they always try at least to have provenance who it came from where it's been whether maybe it was bought from spink and sons in the 1950s you see that often or bought at christie's manson and woods as it was once known many many moons ago um, and a lot of things they turn up uh, you'll you'll check the footnotes and you'll find out that the the, the piece was last sold you know in, in 1905 1910 1920 so lots of early fresh stuff to the market a lot of chinese buyers go there and a lot of English people buy there that are nearby of course and they handle all kinds of other sales they have a lot of good sales and they do a very good job cataloging and uh, put, putting their stuff on catalogs that you can view online. And uh, this is just a quick look at the company. This is this was one of their most famous uh, finds was this uh, water buffalo, jade water buffalo that they sold uh, a number of years ago for 3.4 million pounds, um, which would be, I guess, around four and a half million uh, US, five million US. And they've had other monsters. Um, that they've sold for huge prices. And this is uh, the fellow who's the head of the department. He's very well known in, in, the, in the trade and among the, uh, the collecting community and the museum community. He's an, he's an uh, authenticator on a number of boards for exhibitions and shows. His name is John Axford, and he's highly regarded. Uh, I've never met him, but um, I know people who have, and they like him. So he's very open. And these are some of his staff members, Jeremy Morgan, um, uh, Alexandria Aguiar, and on and on. There's about seven of them that work there. And uh, the photographer, Nelson Chu. And uh, one of the things that's interesting, their photo photography is outstanding. And uh, the, the, I like to look at their, their things and, and check their auctions because they do such a good job of uh, 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 presenting photographs that can be greatly enlarged. And I'll take a look at this. This was the, uh, the Lawrence family Jade collection, Neville Lawrence. And uh, he, he was the son of Walter Lawrence. They give the whole write-up, starting in the 1890s, the tie, ties to India and Kashmir and all that romantic stuff. And uh, this was a, a small sale, small jade sale, but all great examples, about 30 of them. And uh, they, they did very well. They overall did very, very well. There were some rare examples in here. One of the pieces was this, a very fine jambu, uh, jambu, jade bamboo vase. And uh, it measures uh, measured about 18 inches tall. And uh, it did extremely well. It brought uh, about, I think, about $700,000, uh, 700,000 pounds, 690,000 pounds, which is about about 800,000 U.S. This, but the, the one of the things that they do when you go and look at them if you're if you if you get frustrated not being able to examine things online sometimes um william wallace has, has gone the full distance the way christie's and sotheby's have by allowing great amounts of magnification of the objects 
And uh, this, the, their, their objects come into the point of, you know, like it's, it's you know, 10 times its size. Uh, this is just a look at that, that jade. And you see a potential buyer, uh, you could get a really good look at it and check out all the details. You can see the gloss, the light. There's good light variation on it. So you can see it in different light, all in one photograph. Nice reflections that you can check, uh, finish off of and so forth. Lots of good features. Uh, in their photography, all right. And uh, this was a sale that they just had uh, in November. And I know, I know, a number of you were uh, watching for it because I got some uh, inquiries about the pieces, and I thought they were all great. Um, and uh, this, this was one of the pieces that was in the sale. And then there's a, a pair of uh, imperial Chinlung jade bowls. That bamboo vase was also Chinlung. Uh, this very lovely pair, very reminiscent of Mughal jades with the with the ribbed bodies and so forth. These brought 182,000 pounds. Um, and so they get good results, they, but they run good sales. But they also have some very good buys, too. This is why one of the reasons I, I want you, especially if you buy Japanese things, um, uh, because right now Japanese things are, are, are still a little soft in the market, and you can get some great objects for very reasonable amounts of money. And here's a classic. They're not everything that, that William Wallace sells are in the tens of thousands of dollars. They sell things for $100, $50, up to, you know, up to a million. They're a true broad range auction house and this is one, one of the lots that caught my eye and i thought what a great buy this was um, this lot went for 500 pounds or around 600 or so dollars um, a lot of arita and amari wares um, all of it for 500 pounds <laughs> including this big charger over here and this very nicely done uh, soft palette decorated underglaze blue and overglaze enamel charger and then these other pieces and they all looked pretty much to be uh, 18th century or earlier and um, I think the charger is probably earlier than that and they provide of course dimensions and you know all that business and uh, it went for 504 pounds all right, so one, two, three, four, five, six examples. So uh, do the math, all right? So if you're a dealer and you're dealing in Japanese things, it's also a great place to buy things. It's almost worth flying over there and attending the sale and bidding that way. And then and they had the fine Asian art sale. They had five sales this fall, five different Asian art auctions in the month of November. They had this, this extremely rare. And this came from the, um, um, uh, I forget whose collection this came out of. They, they tell, tell about it in the sale. But at any rate, it was a, a gilt copper um, inset figure um, from the um, uh, Mahasri uh, Tara from East India. This is not a, a, a Tibetan piece. It's very close, um, but an extremely rare example. And uh, see if we've got the, the better pictures of it here. Hold on. There it is. All right. And again, you can magnify it. It blew its estimate away. The, esti the estimate was, was right up there, but uh, this ended up doing exceedingly well. It was only around uh, seven or so inches in height, but a very, very fine. They dated it to the 11th or 12th century. It's a very, very early type of bronze. It was estimated at 60 to 80,000 pounds, went for 478,000 pounds, and uh, hasn't, it hasn't been on the market in a, in a very, very long time. And it belonged to Norman Blount. Um, he was a, 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 a jute broker, and there were a number of things from the Blount collection in here. Uh, he, he worked in Asia, and uh, it was uh, the firm was see the uh, Society of Oriental Art. He found he was involved in the Oriental Art Society. It was founded in Calcutta in 1907, and that's the kind of great stuff stories you get with with the pieces from here. I really, really thought that was great. And then they had other things, the Coromandel Kangxi screen. And again, Kangxi screens are still one of the great bargains in the art market. I, I've said it many times. And I still believe it. Uh, this is a fantastic Coromandel screen. It is big. Uh, it's 480 centimeters. So seven feet, uh, eight feet. What is it? Eight feet long? Something like that. Eight by three times nine. Eight. No, bigger than that. Uh, but at any rate, it's huge. It's a regular floor screen. Coromandel. Um, it was beautifully done, and you can you can bring it in and magnify it to your heart's content and get a good look at it. And uh, this whole screen, beautifully done, painted, and carved. All right, and the, I love the dragons on the end, and then all the precious objects going around the top. Uh, ended up selling for seventeen thousand pounds, 
And my, my, my feeling in this is that is an absolute bargain. It's an absolute bargain. Um, the screen was recorded as having bought it. There it is. Christie's was bought in an inventory of, of, of Broom Park, which was an estate in England, in 1960, 1916. Not 1964. 1916, sold by Christie's, Manson, and Woods. There you go. And uh, fantastic looking screen. And surprisingly, they can still sell they can sell rhinoceros horns um, uh, in in England with certain stipulations, with certain certain understandings about when it was brought into the country, and provided it brings over a certain amount of a weight per gram. It's this weird formula they have, and uh, I, I saw some uh, comments about uh, about the ivory and the, and the rhinoceros horns last week. Some of you were sort of critical of the subject, and we're gonna I'm gonna talk about that in another video. Um, uh, what my thoughts are, but uh, for now we're gonna talk about this. This is a great looking rhino horn, spectacularly well carved, dated to the 17th century, with this amazing um, fungi uh, carved base for it. A very very nice example, very well done. I thought I thought. The, to me, this looked a little bit more like a like a, 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 a chin lung example with the wave pattern and all this. But they seem to think or they have some information that indicates it's 17th century, which would mean the probably the middle of the or latter 1600s, I assume. Um, it looks it looks a little later than that to me stylistically, but it's splitting hairs. It's only a matter of 80 years one way one way or the other. Uh, and it did very well. It was estimated at 40 to 60,000 pounds. And even with the global restrictions um, that follow these things around, it still brought 75,000 pounds, even though like you, you couldn't bring it to the United States probably and sell it legally with any any sort of, uh, you know, any sort of ease at all. You, you couldn't sell it. I mean, that's all there is to it. So if whoever buys it is buying it to own it for the time being with a little likelihood of reselling it unless it stays in England and they run it through another auction at some point. Uh, but that was a nice thing. And uh, there's that bronze. We already talked about that. And then there was this is really fine Yongshan uh, period uh, uh, bottle with pomegranates on it. It measured around seven inches tall, estimated at 15 to 25,000 dollars. It sold for 100, uh, 15 to 25,000 pounds, sold for 151 thousand pounds but an absolutely wonderful example really really fine workmanship and uh, notice that this this young shen piece has what they you know so many people look for in porcelains which can be misleading is the heaping and piling effect and uh, i get a lot of questions about that by the way in the in the inquiries people say well it's got heaping and piling so it must be old no they can fake heaping and piling just like they can fake rain marks heaping and piling on porcelain no longer, it never really did mean it was a sign of age and authenticity. You can get brand new porcelains today that are heaped and piled to pieces. Um, they, they know how to do it. They just layer on the cobalt a little thick, keep the, th take the glaze a little thin, and you'll get the, that burnt effect, that black effect of heaping and what's known uh, uh, sort of fancifully as heaping and piling. Now, it, it's sort of in the same school of thought. They used to think that uh, Femi Noir Kangxi pieces, if they had iridescence on the glaze when you held it to the right angle on the light, that it was an absolute sign of authenticity for age to the Kangxi period. And that's absolute poppycock. And I, I think it was Hobson or somebody wrote that because that's what they believed back almost 100 years ago. It's no longer true. It's They, they, they know that's nonsense. And heaping and piling, um, it, it can be an indicator of uh, age, but it's not proof of age. All right. It's just one of many elements. The rest of the piece has to align with it, too, to uh, fall into that period. So keep that in mind. And anyway, this was a heck of an example and and had the mark. And they had the document uh, of the original listing when it was in an auction back uh, 100, over 100 years ago. And uh, it went for uh, 16 pounds, um, which would be... Uh, you know, or I think the pound was trading at about five to one to the dollar back then. So it would have been about roughly the equivalent of 80 U.S. dollars. And uh, in modern day currency, that would have been a couple of thousand dollars, maybe two thousand dollars, something like that. At any rate, it ended up doing really well, selling for 151,000 pounds, which is a significant rise in value since that back then. <clears throat> and then there was this. This was also part of the kitchen. All of these are from the Kitchener collection. Is uh, this really nice Yongshen butterfly vase? A fairly rare type. 
You don't see this very often. This was also in the inventory from uh, 1916 and uh, beautifully decorated. Nice handles. And the hand, one of the handles was missing. You'll notice the bottom left is missing. So this was technically a damaged vase, which did impact the value. And it had a hairline up here. It had several hairlines and it had a chip out of the top. It was not perfect. All right. It had, you can see the, 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 the hint of a chip here. And you see hairlines here, hairlines there and so forth. And a, and, a, and a break right through here. All right, that's the one thing, one nice thing about this magnifier. There it is. There's there's the line. Uh, it looks like this got maybe got dropped and, and the handle got busted and then that happened or got knocked over. There's this hairline here um, and uh, some chips and some breaks and things. So it was far away, from, far 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 from perfect. And because I was kind of wondering why it didn't bring a lot more money, it was estimated very modestly at two to three thousand pounds. Ended up selling for thirty-five thousand pounds, which means somebody's going to spend a lot of money getting it fixed because it's you know it's it's definitely uh, worth it. And uh, it is a Chin Lung Mark and Period vase. Uh, one of the things also about this auction house you'll notice is that they have very modest estimates much of the time. Uh, we talked about estimates a few weeks ago in a video explaining the strategy behind that. And this is something that William Wallace seems to embrace. Um, uh, they, I think they use they use estimates more of a, as a tool to indicate where the reserve might be than uh, always, you know, aiming directly at the, at the ultimate value of the piece. Because you'll often see things estimated at one to two thousand, three to five thousand, and they bring multiples of that. So uh, uh, don't be surprised. But occasionally you can get a great bargain, too. Um, here you have this really rare pair of uh, 18th century Yongchen to Qinlong period um, uh, Canton enamel dolphin form candle holders. These are exceedingly rare. Uh, they do not turn up very often. They are about 10 inches tall. And uh, they were estimated at, you know, three or four thousand uh, pounds. And they ended up selling for about 10 times estimate. But look at these things. These things are fantastic. Absolutely fantastic looking. Uh, I absolutely, you know, you don't. These are the kind of things you don't see much um, in some of the bigger auction houses. Even this is these rare oddities that you are very much likely to pull out of an English country house or something like that. Just superb, great color, and they look like they're in quite good condition for for uh, enamel wares. Uh, and they ended up selling well. They sold for forty thousand pounds, or around fifty-five thousand dollars from a four to six thousand pound estimate. And then hopping along over here, they had a Japanese sale that did very well. And one of them, they had one of these Hampton Court um, Kake Amon decorated vases, uh, which you've seen if you're a Japanese collector, you've seen these before. Um, and we'll, we're going to talk about that. And then they had the, the Arita models of hens, uh, which were quite nice. Uh, we're going to do the hens first. They were estimated very modestly, three to 5,000, sold for 31,000. And these were done during the Edo period, uh, probably during the, 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 the early part of the 18th century, the mid 18th century. Um, they don't give a real accurate amount of dating to these because they are tricky to date. I suspect that's why they did it that way. They just labeled it Edo period, which is a <clears throat> covers a, a period. Well, they said Edo period. Oh, there they go. Edo period, 1670 to 1730. All right. So that's that's the first half, early part of the 18th century, probably. Um, I didn't notice that before. Anyway, I think I thought these were wonderful, uh, these animal forms. And, and one thing that really strikes you is that when you see a pair of these, you're always struck by how strong the certain colors are, especially the reds. Um, they, they, they're they very vibrant colors, very festive, very happy, um, uh, bright colors. And the modeling is superb. The way they layered on the feathers and so forth, uh, they almost look like fish scales, beautifully done. And the expressions on the birds' faces and so forth. These were really nice, and it's a pair. Um, almost, you know, very, very difficult to find. Uh, they measured about 10 inches, eight, nine inches in height. They weren't enormous, but they're were very, very attractive. 31,000 pounds. And then over here, here's one of these Kaki Amon Hampton Court vases with the covers. And uh, those of you who have been collecting Japanese ceramics for any length of time, of course, seeing these in, in lots of reference books, they were extremely uh, popular among the Brits and among people that went to Japan. They were popular among the Japanese royal family. And again, you see these, these soft colors, and then you have these bright, very, very, very sort of festive reds and, and this beautiful, uh, 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 very deep egg yolk yellow that they used. Um, and uh, and then, of course, soft greens, greenish blues, and then blue enamels at the top. Very, very handsome looking vase. And uh, they, sh they showed a porcelain room and an old engraving that had one in it and so forth. 
but uh, very, very handsome. And th these are pretty good size. This this thing was 37 inches tall, 37 centimeters tall, or about 15 inches in height. It's not a little tiny, you know, like a tea caddy or something. It's a pretty good size pot. And uh, that the the, the 60,000 pounds is not an extremely high price for one of these. Uh, uh, not that many years ago, these were bringing you know into six figures. Uh, but the market's changed, and 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 it's it's an opportunity to buy one. You'll find these mostly in you find a lot of these in your, the Rijks museum um and that sort of thing over in europe you'll find them you'll find them in the guimet and uh there's a, the, there's a couple of reference books that have these same identical jars from the keke amon kilns on the covers i think they're wonderful all right and then they had the sort of a general sale on top of it asian art too which had things is so, sort of in the in the in the 500 to ten thousand dollar range lots of vases lots of urns lots of ewers this sort of thing tea jars and then and then generous lots if you're a dealer you want to pay attention to their lots because they put together pretty big lots you know 10 anywhere from three to maybe 10 or 15 things sometimes uh and you want to check those out and interesting examples interesting interesting i like this cobalt uh baitong uh, the brush pot at any rate it's it's a it's an auction house worth looking at i think in the future we'll pay a little more attention to them because i i talk about them and i assume everybody knows about this company but that's sort of a quick introduction to it uh they do not run their sales on live auctioneers and invaluable all right this is one of the reasons you don't see or hear much from them people in the uk go there all the time people in france shop there all the time but they don't they don't advertise their sales they advertise their sales on saleroom.com uh, the sale room and uh, they put their ads in the uh, in the uh, Gazette uh, in England but uh, other than that you're not going to find them on invaluable so if you're wondering are they a new auction house no they're a very old auction house but they they run their business a little bit more in the old-fashioned way um, and and they and I, I suspect they they've decided that they would just build their own website do their own thing and not be dependent on on uh, outside vendors to promote their auctions and it has not hurt them one bit from what I've seen all right. From what I can see, they get as good a price as anybody else. Um, and but they but they used um, invaluable up to about 10 years ago, and they gave up on it when they fully developed their own site. And that's why you don't see them often. And uh, you should check them out. They run the they run auctions, Asian sales. Um, so like I said, several times a year. Uh, and they also do, of course, other other types of auctions and whatnot. All right. And getting over to that, I just mentioned the antique gazette reminded me of something. Hold on a second there um on the uh, uh uh patreon page this week we added to the collection section if you i just mentioned the antiques gazette and uh here at antiques trade gazette i have linked it to the site and the antiques trades gazette is a paid subscriber uh, uh, uh newspaper online it's a weekly newspaper it comes out every week and um, what i've done is i've linked a subscription uh for this and included it in the patreon page <clears throat> so if you want to see what's going on at the antiques trades gazette you just click the link i think we we put in five of them or four of them to get it started and you get a copy of their magazine um, and you can only get it with a, through a subscription, and the subscription is $180 a year. And this is the paper. It's free with the Patreon deal. Um, and uh, they have lots of ads uh, uh, for upcoming sales. They have lots of good articles. It's a, a very productive newspaper. They put out a lot of stuff. They own the sale room. I believe there's a relationship between the Gazette and the sale room. I think they they built the sale room or they, they own it or something. Uh, so you'll see a lot of stuff on the sale room that's also in the Gazette and vice versa. It's a good it's a good marketing angle for them. And they do fairly comprehensive articles on specific topics. Um, not always just Asian art, but European art, jewelry, carpets, textiles, rare furniture, discoveries. Uh, you know, they find Roman coins. Uh, here's one on here of, of the $110,000 hardwood chest that sold an imperial chest. Um, they had another one on a Korean screen that was bought that's going to an American museum and so forth. And then lots of advertisements and uh, so forth. So do check them out. Do check it out if you're using the, uh, the your Patreon subscriber. Uh, it's, it's, it's worth it. It's a, it's a very good read. It'll keep you current. 
All right, now, uh, what happened on eBay this past week? There's some pretty good results. There's not a lot on there right now. There's, there's a number of things we did find that are pretty good for the coming week. Uh, but we always look for the doldrums between now and after New Year's because people have other things to do. <laughs> Hard to believe, I know, but they do. But this is the end of the – when Joni's up in Canada had a sale, they had a number of good items in there um, uh, last week on eBay that closed on uh, – when did it close? Last Sunday uh, was this, this very nice celadon ground with under glazed blue decorated vase uh 19th or maybe late 18th century um it was a little hard to tell because the uh the foot rim was so dirty on this thing it was a little bit it needed a cleaning uh ended up selling for 1853 dollars the the glaze on it though certainly looks early 19th century the way it was finished um th this this business in here the way this is decorated um, if I had, to, I had to say when it was made, it was, you know, definitely made in the first half, first quarter or so of, of the 19th century, possibly the late 18th century, but a nice face and uh, it did fine. It brought $1,853. And then they had the, uh, uh, the, the Straits uh, Phoenix jar that we talked about a few times. And it, we thought it would bring, you know, four or 5,000. It went a little over it. It went up to 6,100 this time. Uh, very nice jar. A handsome jar. It was online for a couple of weekends, did very, very well, but had brilliant colors. Those those wonderful colors that you look for in Straits, Straits community wears, very festive, very happy. Um, and it was nicely decorated, had scrofito ground all the way around and um, so forth. So it did fine. And then hopping along over to this, the uh, dragon jar, the, the big dragon jar that was doing well from the get-go. Uh, it ended up selling for $8,200. Very attractive piece of porcelain. Beautiful decoration all the way around. I love the dragons because they're all in different poses, poking around on the thing. I thought it was pretty good. I think I liked that a lot. And it did well. It did really well. It brought $8,200. And then along over to this is the uh, the uh, Fitzhugh uh, Export Armorial um, uh, uh, platter that had the ship on it with the monogram at the top. A very, very fine example, or Nanking ware, I guess this is technically rather than Fitzhugh, but beautifully done, beautifully done all the way around. Uh, I don't see any spear borders on it, so I guess it is still technically Fitzhugh. Uh, nice honeycomb pattern, uh, British ship in the center and so forth. Chunlung period ended up selling for six hundred and twenty-two dollars. I think we said a couple of weeks ago we thought we'd bring around six hundred, six fifty somewhere in there, and it did. It did very predictable, uh, nice looking piece of ceramic. And they had this a regular Fitzhugh platter that you many of you seen many many of these with the spear border going around it. Very very fine spearhead border, nice elements splashed in there of course, and then the center the centerpiece with more spears surrounding. Um, uh, flowers and all that great stuff. And uh, no ship on this one, though. So it sold for $233. That's the difference. That's why these pieces that have unusual things on them, like ships, um, attract such attention among collectors and also maritime collectors, things like that. But this was an equally fine dish that sold for, you know, uh, one third of the price of the other one. All right. And then along over to these, the pair of unusual 18th century uh, scrolling plates. Um, there's another one that's floating around out there in another auction right now. Uh, and they, they did what, sort of what we thought they'd bring. They brought $760. Um, they, they're awfully unusual. They're very attractive. The colors are good. They are not identical. They're slightly different, but very complimentary to one another. Um, and I, I think things like this are always so much fun to look at because uh, uh, they're, they're a pair, but they're, they're sort of a, a complementary pair, as they say. All right. And then over this, that nice snuff bottle. Um, I wish this had a little underglazed red on it. It would have really, really taken off. It did fine. It brought $481, which was right about where we thought it would land, uh, around four to 500 um, nice looking. Uh, I love the dra the back of the dragon going up it, and here you have the flaming pearl and so forth. And there's the dragon chasing it. It's a very attractive little snuff with a nice cafe, sort of soft cafe ground with crackle in it, uh, and uh, 19th century, and uh, 481 bucks. And then the last thing was this, uh, the Chinese uh, Famille Rose Buddha. Uh, you see these all the time. Uh, they were all made pretty much during the at the very end of the Qing Dynasty and mostly during the Republic period. And there, was a, there were a couple of factories in particular that were well known for making them. And they have very recognizable seals on the bottom um, that you'll see. And here's the, uh, the the back pattern on this, which is flowers. Sometimes it's, it's a brick pattern in the robes that they use. Um, there's the bottom of it. 
Is this what, there? There's the stamp mark right there next to the hole, next to the next to the uh, the, the vent hole in the bottom. You can't really read it though. It's not terribly clear. Um, anyway, it did well. These always do well, especially if they're good size and in good condition. Though they don't have any cracks or hairlines in them. This one brought twenty one hundred and five dollars. Uh, and everybody wants one of these. So if you haven't got one, try to get yourself one for your house. Have a happy Buddha. Put it right in your kitchen. All right. Now, uh, what's coming up? Uh, over here. Bang, this thing. Uh, there's some Japan, interesting Japanese material uh, coming up. Uh, this is somebody that uh, uh, he's, he's, he's a user here, actually. He's a collector, and he occasionally sells things. And uh, he has this very nice gold and copper inlay Koro, uh, Meiji period. Uh, it's quite a striking thing. I like the, I think that's a fox on there. I like that a lot. Nice work, nice patination. Um, it's up to $367. It closes on Monday. It should get up to six to 800 before it's done, but a handsome piece of bronze, nice piece of metal work. He also has this up, a nice lacquered gold box with Maki and Mother of Pearl inlay decoration. Dates to the Meiji period. It's 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 right now it's up to only $100. It's a nice box. If you've been looking for a nice piece of lacquerware, you might want to check this out. This is a good looking box. Beautifully decorated, nice soft surface on it. Um, it's it's got a tiny bit of a roughness on one corner underneath, but that's it. Um, there's nothing. Uh, there's no 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 body cracks or any of that business. It's a very attractive box, and uh, it 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 should bring um, you know five to seven hundred dollars pretty easily at the end. All right, and then over here to this, uh, this will be on the news. All these pieces will be on this week's newsletter page. Is this this very attractive bottle vase done in the uh, 18th century style with uh, Buddhist uh, uh, objects hanging from tassels running down it? This is a 19th century vase, but it's wonderfully decorated. Really, really wonderfully decorated. Um, blow this up a little bit. I like this a lot. And it has a chin lung mark, a four character chin lung mark on the bottom, which is apocryphal, of course. But uh, the decoration on this is very fine quality. Here's a picture of the bottom. Very nice looking foot rim, four character mark. Um, that's not something you, you don't find them typically done this, the mark done in that, in the period, in this style, um, so, so to speak, unless it's within a square and um, often in colors. And that would be something that would have been done at the, most likely at the imperial kiln at the palace. Uh, but they used the four character mark in the 19th century. And uh, this looks to be sort of a, a, a first half to mid 19th century vase. Uh, it's very, very nicely done though. Beautifully done. And uh, right now it's up to just uh, $23 with four days to go. It should get up to $1,000, I would think, by the time it's over. It's a very attractive piece of porcelain. And then over here to this, this is interesting. This is a very cool thing. Um, this is a, a seller in, in uh, California, Water, Water Man Art got this. This is a, 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 a Jun um, 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 a, a Song de Yohan Dynasty um, piece of Junware that's been fitted into this, this it looks like onyx and um, metalwork uh, stand as an urn. It's very clever. I, 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 you know, they, they did all kinds of crazy things with porcelain back in the day, especially between 1900 and the 1930s. This is one of them. It's a nice piece of porcelain. It's interestingly displayed, and it's sort of a relic of, of how, how they, how they uh, repurposed things a um, uh, uh, hundred years ago. And this is a nice example. It closes Sunday. For some reason, it's only up to $15. This is a cool thing. Uh, how big is this? It's a pretty good size. Uh, it's probably 10 inches or so in height, I would think, with the all in and done. Um, a fireplace vase made around 1850, 1880. They think it was made uh, or before 1900, they think. Okay. Um, I don't know why he thinks that, but he, that's okay. They, they could have done it. It's not impossible, but you don't see many much of this kind of material getting into the U.S. prior to about 1890, so I'm not quite sure why they thought it was done earlier but regardless um did he include the height uh, let's see did he go the ruler route no no ruler no measurements that's kind of silly any rate this bowl is probably four inches tall the stand is probably six inches so it's about not nine to eleven inches in height Figure it that way, but it should bring a lot more than where it is. It should, it should this should bring eight to twelve hundred dollars, I would think. 
And then this, the, the Amari, Japanese Amari uh, barber bowl from the Arita area, uh, very unusual. You don't see these very often. It's, an, it's a 17th or early 18th century bowl, nicely decorated. Um, looks like it's in pretty good shape all around. Uh, da, da, da. There's the back of it. It's got a spider crack in the bottom, but it's, an, it's a good form. It's a desirable form if you're an Arita collector. Um, I don't think it's 17th century. I, I think it's more likely early 18th century. But, and, you know, again, people like, you know, pe pe people get things in their head about dates. And sometimes I think they're a little optimistic, but that's OK. Uh, this is a nice ball, regardless. And uh, then there's this a very so, and, and I, so I've gotten emails from a few of you, if you're watching this, um, that you're interested in buying um, a pewter with Yixing liners. Pewter teapots with jade handles and Yixing lighters. Many of you have seen them. This is a leaf form um, uh, type um, back, front, side, and so forth. Nicely done with an inscription on it. Uh, very attractive. And I think he says in the description that the the liner is not cracked. As you all know, if the if the pewter liner within the the the, the Yixing liner inside these pots is damaged, um, it, it severely uh, impacts the value. Uh, and there it is with the with the potter's stamp in the bottom, as you should find in most of them. It's only up to $188. It closes Monday. It should bring a thousand to fifteen hundred. Uh, let's see here. Very rare pewter in case Yixing clay, jade handle, spout artist, the, the interior clay. Um, Okay, I'm just trying to see if there's a very fine condition, has some surface dents and scratches. Clay appears to be complete and intact inside. Okay, that's that's what you want to hear. Um, should bring a, it should bring a thousand to fifteen hundred or twelve to sixteen hundred before it's done. It's a nice looking example. And then over to this, the last thing is a, a Karancha red Fukigawa plate, um, and it's uh, and it's marked. And this is a buy it now plate. I'm going to include it in this week's newsletter because uh, it's a Karancha kiln plate. Karancha was the, uh, the the Karancha family kiln was one of the earliest kilns in Arita. It was it's a, it's a 400 year old uh, business, and uh, they did some extremely fine work. And this one has that that Kenrandi red uh, ground with outlined in gilt of uh, uh, scholars, figures, or, or men and women reading a scroll in this very nicely done uh, multicolor bambooed border on that red ground. I think this is a very striking porcelain and it measures, what is this, about probably eight inches in diameter, 8.5 inches in diameter, but a very sweet example um, from, the, from the late Meiji period. Here's the bottom of it with a couple of spur marks and so forth, but certainly worth looking at. All right. <clears throat> that's it for the week. Um, I, I hope you all have a great weekend and I hope you're all on a long weekend and uh, um, you're taking the time to have some fun and relax. Uh, we are. And uh, thanks so much for watching. And if you haven't subscribed yet here on YouTube, please do. Uh, we, as you know, we do we do one or two videos every single week. This is all we talk about is auctions and the Asian art community and Asian art collecting and, you know, all the all the fun stuff. Uh, so if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. And uh, thanks so much. Leave a comment. Give us a thumbs up. Give thumbs up. They help the algorithm. I, I keep getting things from YouTube to, to, wanting to know, um, you know, uh, reminding you that you should you should get people to click the thumbs up thing. So click the thumbs up thing uh, to make YouTube happy. All right. Have a great weekend and see you next week. We have a lot going on. All right. Bye bye.